regulations. House will be in order. The prayer will be offered by our guest chaplain today, Reverend uh, Brian uh, Thiessen, uh, Journey Church, Bridgeville, Pennsylvania. Father, we thank you for this nation, your love, and most of all, your forgiveness of sins. We acknowledge, as Scripture states in James 1.5, that you are the giver of all wisdom. May you give these men and women whom you have placed in leadership over this nation your wisdom in all their deeds and discussions. According to Romans 13, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. May these here be good stewards of this responsibility, leadership, and your gift of freedom for our nation. We ask for your special protection over our military and blessing for their families. We pray for our enemies as you instruct us in Matthew 5.44. May their plans be thwarted, and may they come to the love and grace that only you can offer. In the only name through whom man can be saved, Jesus Christ, amen. amen. The chair has examined the journal of the last day's proceedings and announces to the House his approval thereof. Pursuant to Clause 1 of Rule 1, the journal stands approved. The Pledge of Allegiance today will be led uh, by the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Fleischman. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America 
and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, without objection, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Murphy, is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to introduce today's guest chaplain, Pastor Brian Thiessen of the Journey Assembly of God Church in Bridgeville, Pennsylvania. Since the House uh, first used a chaplain and was elected by Congress in 1789, it has been tradition for a prayer to open the House daily floor proceedings, and I thank the office of the chaplain and Reverend Patrick Conroy for allowing Patrick, um, Pastor Brian Thiessen to have the opportunity to continue this tradition and lead us in prayer. Pastor Thiessen joined the Bridge Oak community in April 2011 along with his wife Karanda and has been a driving force in improving the community since the moment he stepped foot in southwestern Pennsylvania. During Pastor Thiessen's tenure, he has seen his parish grow in size, which can directly be attributed to the exceptional work he has done in leading his church. He has also been elected president of the Bridgeville Ministers Association, where he leads Bridgeville area churches and nonprofit organizations in community outreach events. He also serves as the Christian Education Director of the Southwest Metro Section of the Assemblies of God. As Director, Pastor Thiessen guides 35 churches in Christian education programs and ministries in the southwestern Pennsylvania region. I especially thank Pastor Thiessen and members of his parish for making the trip to Washington this morning. The House is very pleased to have all of them, and we're excited to hear the words of the Lord he has chosen to share with us today. I yield back. Chair lays before the House the following enrolled bill. H.R. 2192, an act to exempt for an additional four-year period from the application of the means test presumption of abuse under Chapter 7, qualifying members of reserve components of the armed forces and members of the National Guard who, after September 11, 2001, are called to active duty or to perform a homeland defense activity for not less than 90 days. The chair will entertain requests for 15 one-minute speeches on each side of the aisle. For what purpose does the gentleman from South Carolina rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, today the House will begin consideration of the regulations from the Executive in Need of Scrutiny Act of 2011, also referred to as the RAINS Act. This bill will require Congress to approve any federal regulation that will impact our economy by $100 million or more. The Small Business Administration estimates that regulations are costing our nation's citizens $1.75 trillion per year. The current administration's report on federal regulations listed over 4,200 under development since last December and over 200 additional regulations proposed this year, costing consumers billions of dollars, destroying jobs. This fact is another example of how out of touch the President is with the hardworking and deserving American families. It is time for Congress to take action and stop the imposition of these job-killing policies that discourage small businesses from growing and expanding. In conclusion, God bless our troops, and we will never forget September 11th and the global war on terrorism. For what purpose does this gentleman from Connecticut rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, America's third president, John Adams, once said, facts are stubborn things, and whatever may be our wishes or the dictates of our passion, they cannot alter the state of facts and evidence. Well, Mr. Speaker, the facts now show that the health care reform law is working for America's seniors. This morning, CMS released figures that showed that 2.7 million seniors saved $1.2 billion in 2011 with lower prescription drug costs because the health care reform law is closing the prescription drug donut hole. 28,500 Connecticut 5,560 in my district, the second district. The report also shows that 24 million seniors have used the annual checkup that the health care reform law now provides free of charge, a smarter, more intelligent way to pick up disease and illness for our, for our elderly. As, the pres as President Adams once said, facts are stubborn things, and the facts show the health care reform law is working for America's seniors. I yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Speaker, I request permission to address the House for one minute. Without objection.
Mr. Speaker, uh, freedom of choice is under attack by Washington. The government wants to control the light in homes and businesses throughout America. A new law bans the incandescent light bulb and require Americans to buy the new special $3 government-approved light bulb. Soon it will be against the law to sell Thomas Edison's incandescent light bulb, the symbol of American innovation. This kind of government intrusion in our lives has left many Americans in the dark about what's next. Government invasion in our lives is only increasing. Since the federal government has taken the power to choose away from Americans, people are flocking to the local Walmarts to hoard the last of the incandescent light bulbs. Government controls so much of our lives in the name that government is smarter than we are. But for now, it's turn out the lights, the party's over for Thomas Edison's incandescent light bulb. And that's just the way it is. What purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey rise? I'm content to address the House for one minute to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, the national move to interfere with voting rights of eligible citizens is deliberate. In 2011, the number of states requiring strict forms of government-issued IDs has nearly quadrupled. Why the sudden increase? Well, proponents claim that voter fraud is the driving force. Yet there is no evidence of this kind of deception. What do they think? There are droves of people sneaking across the southern border so they could vote? Or 15-year-olds trying to sneak into voting booths and so we've got to card them? This is simply discrimination masquerading as orderly government. The Brennan Center for Justice estimates that one in ten eligible registered voters do not have the forms of ID that are acceptable under these expanding state laws. We can't stand by and let big money and special interests manipulate the results of elections by enacting 21st century poll taxes. Poll taxes were thrown out decades ago as discrimination and contrary to democratic processes. For what purpose does the gentleman from Alabama rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, during the House Armed Services Committee's review of the National Defense Authorization Act, or NDAA, I successfully proposed a two-tier amendment to protect America's missile defense technology. Tier 1 bars the White House from giving the Russian Federation any American hit-to-kill or other sensitive missile defense technology. Tier 2 bars the White House from giving Russia any American non-sensitive missile defense technology unless the White House first certifies to Congress that America's missile defense will not be undermined and our technology will not be proliferated. Senator Mark Kirk of Illinois is blocking the Russian ambassador nomination until appropriate safeguards exist that protect America's missile defense technology. I applaud Senator Kirk's efforts. The NDAA is now in conference committee. I urge the conferees to support the Hask Amendment and safeguard missile defense technologies that have cost American taxpayers so much and help protect America so well. Mr. Speaker, I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Tennessee rise? Without objection. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, today I rise to recognize not only one of the greatest coaches of all time, but also one of the greatest people of all time, University of Tennessee Lady Vols coach Pat Summit. Yesterday, Coach Summit was named Sports Illustrated's Sportswoman of the Year, and there was no one more deserving than her. Not only is she the all-time winningest coach in NCAA basketball history with well over 1,000 wins, including 16 SEC titles and eight national championships, but she is also an exemplary role model for the students she coaches and a shining ambassador for the university she represents. Earlier this year, Coach Summit was diagnosed with early onset dementia, Alzheimer's type. While the news would be unbearable for many to take at such a young age, Coach Summit has stayed on the sidelines and continues to coach the Lady Vols. She is again leading by example and showing her players that while life is full of obstacles, 
you can continue to achieve success through hard work and dedication. Thank you, Coach Summit. I am glad you represent my alma mater. Go Big Orange. I yield back. What purpose does the gentleman from Indiana rise? Address the House for one minute. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, as a cardiothoracic surgeon, I stand here today to voice my concern about the impending cuts to the Medicare program. I implore, implore Congress to craft a multi-year fix to the SGR, ideally a permanent fix. This is a real threat to seniors across the country. Each year, the Congress continues to play politics with seniors' access to quality care. This must end. Seniors, some of our most vulnerable citizens, may not be able to see the doctors of their choosing if Congress does not address this issue. According to the AMA, one in three physicians are limiting the number of new Medicare patients they see, and one in eight doctors are no longer taking new Medicare patients. That's today. What is more disturbing than these immediate cuts is the fast approaching insolvency date. This is a critical problem and ignoring the insolvency date of 2024 puts our seniors' care at risk once again on, even, on an even larger scale than what we're facing today. We cannot continue to, to bury our heads in the sand. As a physician, on behalf of my patients, let's act now to protect the Medicare program and ensure access to quality care for America's seniors. I yield back. What purpose does the gentleman from Colorado rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to honor the 150th anniversary of Larimer County, Colorado. The first settlers arrived in 1858, and Antoine Janus, who led the party, declared the area of present-day Larimer County to be the loveliest spot on earth. Larimer County captures what outsiders envision as Colorado's true beauty. The county is named after General William Larimer, an early Denver settler and founder who was made the county's namesake as a tribute. From the farmlands to the majestic mountains, robust business sector, and kind people, Larimer County is Colorado. It is the sixth most populous county in the state. While other areas of Colorado were settled and founded at the prospect of gold and mining riches, Larimer County was different. It attracted many settlers because of fertile lands and reliable water sources. Larimer County started as an agricultural area and continues to flourish in agricultural production today. Aside from ag, Larimer County has a thriving business and health industry, a strong education system, picture-perfect scenery, wonderful locations for outdoor recreation, and a top-tier research university at Colorado State University. In my humble opinion, Rocky Mountain National Park in Larimer County is one of the most beautiful places in the entire country and the crown jewel of our national park system. It is my honor to recognize Larimer County's 150th anniversary on the House floor and acknowledge all it has to offer. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Georgia rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, Medicare physicians are facing a 28 percent cut come January the 1st, 2012, unless this Congress acts to stop it. If left alone, these cuts will force many physicians to stop seeing med Medicare beneficiaries, a move that could harm millions of seniors who are in search of care. It is incomprehensible that congressional Democrats have already cut Medicare provider rates as a way to help pay for Obamacare. And again, they offered to cut provider rates during our debt negotiations this Congress. Providers in my district and across this country have told me that if Congress continues to cut provider rates, they won't be able to see Medicare patients, pure and simple. In fact, the CMS actuary, Rick Foster, has told us that the cuts to hospitals in Obamacare alone will force 15 percent of these facilities to close. The seniors in my district tell me they can't afford to lose their doctor. Let's get a fix to this problem done and done permanently. And I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, health savings accounts have been shown to lower health care costs and allow all Americans to have more control over their money and their health care decisions. Recently, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported that 14 percent of all workers in the private sector now have access to a health savings account. The number of people with HSA type accounts rose to over 11.5 million in January, uh, from 10 million a year before and 8 million the year before that. Mr. Speaker, health savings accounts are at risk. Under the Affordable Care Act passed in this House in March of 2010, 
By 2014, there will be a phase in of what's known as the medical loss ratio rules that may eliminate the ability of HSAs to continue to exist. It's all in the hands of the Secretary of Health and Human Services, who in the past has not been favorably disposed to HSAs. Now, Governor Mitch Daniels understands the power of consumer-directed health care. Governor Daniels, when he came and talked to our health caucus a little over a year ago, talked about his Healthy Indiana plan, a plan that in his state has allowed him to provide for his state workers health care benefits that are uh, receive a positive approval rating by 94 percent of his 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 workers, and at the same time lowering costs by 11 percent. This is the type of innovation that the Affordable Care Act should have fostered. Instead, it stands in the way of this groundbreaking way to deliver health care to our nation's folks. Thank you, and I'll yield back. What purpose does the gentleman from Tennessee rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker. As both a practicing physician and a member of Congress, I have had numerous discussions with patients and constituents regarding how difficult it is for Medicare beneficiaries to find access to care. Unfortunately, this dilemma will only be exacerbated if Congress fails to enact legislation by the year's end for the sustainable growth rate, the formula in which physicians are paid for treating seniors on Medicare. Without congressional action, physician reimbursement will be cut by 28 percent on January 1, 2011, which will drastically hurt seniors' ability to find medical care. For roughly eight years, Congress has applied a short-term fix to resolve these cuts. Republic Republican doctors are committed to enacting a permanent solution to the flawed SGR formula. Democrats had the chance to deal with this issue during the passage of Obamacare, but instead chose to cut roughly $525 billion from Medicare. Congress must have the courage to repeal the flawed SGR formula and create a sustainable and reliable payment schedule. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Louisiana rise? Without objection, recognized. Mr. Speaker. Nearly three years ago, the President of the United States stood in this chamber and said, we need health care reform to address the crushing cost of health care and to strengthen Medicare for years to come. Well, we got the President's type of health care reform. Seniors had to help pay for it, however, by removing $500 billion, a half a trillion dollars, from Medicare in order to subsidize Obamacare. But guess what? That's made Medicare even weaker. Today, we're trying to find billions of dollars to pay for another temporary fix to Medicare reimbursement rates to ensure access by patients to their physicians. Last year, it cost $19 billion, and it'll cost more in future years. Obamacare did not bend the cost curve down and as, we, as it was promised. It just pushed the issue down the road. Republicans are committed to getting the doc fix done and finding a permanent solution. But Medicare is running out of money, and these fixes are getting more expensive. It's time to repeal Obamacare and replace it with reforms that truly strengthen Medicare for years to come. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, the Pew Research Center has found that negative opinions about news organizations now equal or surpass all-time highs. In their poll, 66% of those surveyed stated news stories are often inaccurate, and 77% think that news organizations tend to favor one side over the other. And in a recent Gallup poll, Americans were asked how much trust and confidence they have in the mass media. A majority, 55%, responded, not very much or none at all. Three years ago, I started the Media Fairness Caucus in Congress. This caucus helps encourage a free and fair media as our founders intended. The purpose of the caucus is not to censor or condemn, but to urge the media to adhere to the highest standards of their profession and to provide the American people with the facts, balanced stories, and fair coverage of the news. Our national media should be held accountable for their performance, just like any other institution. We need to remind the media of their profound obligation to provide the American people with the facts, not tell them what to think. For what purposes does the gentleman from Illinois rise? Without objection. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to congratulate the Northern Illinois University Husky football team for winning the 2011 Mid-American Conference Championship. Last Friday, the Huskies overcame three first-half turnovers and a 20-point deficit to defeat the Bobcats of Ohio University with a last-second field goal as time expired. The incredible win caps off another great season for the Northern Illinois University Huskies as they finished with a 10 and 3 overall record and now head to the GoDaddy.com Bowl on January 8th to play Arkansas State. Congratulations to the players, coaches, and support staff for all of the Huskies for another fantastic season. Go Huskies. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Oklahoma rise? Without objection. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to praise the incredible people of Oklahoma City and the wonderful community they're building for our retired military veterans. A recent study conducted in 379 cities nationwide by USAA and Military.com ranked Oklahoma City as the number one city for a second career for military retirees. Oklahoma City's economy is boosted by a great combination of veteran-owned businesses, defense contracting companies, federal workers, and Tinker Air Force Base. The study simply proves what Oklahomans already know. Oklahoma is a great place to live and to work. Oklahoma City is one of the lowest unemployment rates in the nation and one of the highest work ethics. Oklahoma City is a great place to raise a family, start a new career, or retire. The vets who have chosen to live in Oklahoma City are hardworking individuals with great skills, a great work ethic, and a love for our country. Military retirees make long-lasting contributions within their communities, and they're vital to our state's success. My message to veterans across the nation who want to start a new business or a new career or find a community that honors vets for their service, you're welcome to join us in Oklahoma City. For what purpose does the general lady from New York rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I rise to call attention to a looming crisis for our seniors. We are facing the very real prospect of millions of Americans losing their access to health care providers because of reductions in Medicare payments to physicians due to the flawed sustainable growth SGR formula. Mr. Speaker, on January 1, 2012, the SGR formula will trigger a 27.4% pay cut across the board for Medicare physician services. According to the AMA, my home state of New York, New York, Mr. Speaker, this cut will amount to $28,000 per physician. That loss makes it harder for physicians to pay for office staff, space, and equipment, which translates, Mr. Speaker, to decreased access to care for many patients. Many physicians have indicated that they will no longer accept Medicare patients. Our seniors, Mr. Speaker, rely on Medicare, which they have paid into and has been there for them. Mr. Speaker, doctors want to provide care to our seniors, and we cannot allow Medicare payment cuts to prevent doctors from serving all of their patients. Our doctors deserve better. Our seniors deserve better. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Arizona rise? Consent. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, 10,000 older Americans are entering the Medicare system every day. So access to quality physicians is more important than ever. The sad fact is we are not paying our Medicare providers enough to keep their doors open, much less accept new patients. In usual Washington fashion, past Congresses have kicked the can down the road. And if we don't act before the end of the year, physicians will face a 27% cut in their Medicare reimbursement. We need to come together and find a better method to pay our Medicare physicians for the long term and include it in a properly thought out health care reform. If we continue to allow these flawed po policies, Medicare patients will suffer and we owe our seniors better. Our seniors were made promises by those who came before us serving you today. And I'm here to tell you that we will keep those promises. Taking up this important fix to health care before it's too late will allow us to continue to be the best nation, a healthy nation that we can be proud to leave our children and grandchildren. I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back.
For what purpose does the gentleman from Florida rise? Mr. Speaker, by direction of the Committee on Rules, I call up House Resolution 479 and ask for its immediate consideration. The clerk will report the resolution. House Calendar Number 95, House Resolution 479, resolved that at any time after the adoption of this resolution, the Speaker may, pursuant to Clause 2B of Rule 18, declare the House resolved into the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for consideration of the bill, H.R. 10, to amend Chapter 8 of Title V, United States Code, to provide that major rules of the executive branch shall have no force or effect unless a joint resolution of approval is enacted into law. The first reading of the bill shall be dispensed with. All points of order against consideration of the bill are waived. Under general, de general debate shall be confined to the bill and shall not exceed one hour equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the committee on the, on the judiciary. After general debate, the bill shall be considered for amendment under the five-minute rule. In lieu of the amendment and the nature of a substitute recommended by the Committee on the Judiciary now printed in the bill, the amendment and the nature of a substitute recommended by the Committee on Rules now printed in the bill, modified by the amendment printed in Part A of the report of the Committee on Rules accompanying this resolution, shall be considered as adopted in the House and in the Committee of the Whole. The bill as amended shall be considered as the original bill for the purpose of further amendment under the five-minute rule and shall be considered as read. All points of order against provisions in the bill as amended are waived. No further amendment to the bill as amended shall be in order except those printed in Part B of the report of the Committee on Rules. Each such amendment may be offered only in the order printed in the report, may be offered only by a member designated in the report shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent, shall not be subject to amendment, and shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question in the House or in the Committee of the Whole. All points of order against such amendments are waived. At the conclusion of consideration of the bill for amendment, the Committee shall rise and report the bill as amended to the House with such further amendments as may have been adopted. The previous question shall be considered as ordered on the bill and amendments thereto to final passage without intervening motion except one motion to recommit with or without instructions. Section 2. During any recess or adjournment of not more than three days, if in the opinion of the Speaker the public interest so warrants, then the Speaker or his designee, after consultation with the minority leader, may reconvene the House at a time other than that previously appointed within the limits of Clause 4, Section 5, Article 1 of the Constitution, and notify members accordingly. Section 3, Clause 3 of Rule 29 shall apply to the availability requirements for a confer conference report and the accompanying joint statement under Clause, clause 8A1 of Rule 22. The gentleman from Florida is recognized for one hour. Mr. Speaker, for the purposes of debate only, I yield the customary 30 minutes to the gentlewoman from New York, Mrs. Slaughter, pending which time I yield myself such time as I may consume. During consideration of this resolution, all time yield is for the purpose of debate only. Mr. Speaker, I ask for unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in support of this rule, House Resolution 479. House Res 479 provides a structured rule so that the House may consider House Resolution 10, the regulations from Executive in Need of Scrutiny Act. The rule gives the House the opportunity to debate a wide array of important, germane amendments offered by members from both sides of the aisle. Better known as the RAINS Act, the underlying legislation is a pivotal bill that would change the very way Washington does business. The RAINS Act takes a step back and looks at our current regulatory process, where Congress passes broad general laws that lets the executives, uh, executive branch interpret and regulate them how they see fit. H.R. 10 brings back to the vision that our founding fathers had this nation and for the institution of Congress. I would assure you that our three branches are co-equals. The way they're designed to be, H.R. 10 would hold Congress accountable for setting America's regulatory 
policies. It makes Congress do the work that our founders intended this institution, the first branch to do, to regulate. Mr. Speaker, I know that regulations have been a buzzword up here in Congress recently, and I think it's become so popular, so frequently discussed, because people in Washington Beltway, within the Beltway, are finally starting to wake up to the fact that those in my home state of Florida have been telling me since before I ever came here that regulations matter, that government can't really do much to actually create jobs or to physically put people back to work. We might wish it was so, but we don't have the magic job formulas on either side of the aisle that we can use to suddenly create millions of jobs for the nearly 9% of Americans that are currently out of work. That what we can do is create an environment where real job creators, small businesses, and private companies can gain access to capital, operate with as much regulatory certainty as possible. Unfortunately, it's hard to create such an environment when the executive branch is constantly churning out one major regulation after another. According to the Congressional Research Service, during the first two years in office, federal agencies under the administration leadership of the Obama administration published over 175 major rules. These regulations impose tens of billions of dollars of new costs annually on our economy and on consumers. This is the top, on, on top of the continuing burden of red tape that we're already up against, uh, which Small Business Administration estimates to cost $1.75 trillion, $1.75 trillion yearly. The Federal Register is sort of like the daily newspaper of the federal government. It holds federal agency regulations, proposed rules and public notices, executive orders and proclamations, and other presidential documents. According to the National Archives website, you should read the Federal Register if, among other things, your business is regulated by the federal government, if you're an attorney, if your organization attends public hearings, if you apply for grants, if you're concerned with government actions that affect the environment, health care, financial services, exports, education, and other major policy issues. Reading this recommendation, it sounds to me like they're saying, if you're active and informed member of the American public, you need to know what's in the Federal Register. What they don't mention is that the complete Federal Register today stands at 72,820 pages long. That's 145, over 145 reams of paper that contain regulations. To help that put it in perspective, that's 275 pounds of paper. And for my Floridian friends, that's about three Josh Freemans, the quarterback of the Tampa Bay Bucks. Within Within these nearly 73,000 pages of regulations that result in 120 million hours of paperwork burdens for United States business every year. The 2011 Federal Register cost American employers, the rules that are contained, almost 93, 93 million dollars in compliance costs, which equals to about 1.8 million jobs. Think about everything that job creators could do in spending, instead of spending hundreds of millions of hours filling out paperwork for the federal government, all the jobs that could be created if they weren't spending money complying with regulations that Congress, that Congress hasn't even put on them, but regulatory agencies have. H.R. 10 really does rein in these burdens. Instead of letting the White House decide what the regulations should be, only allowing Congress to disapprove an executive's action, H.R. 10 flips the current system on its head. The Reins Act says that if the executive branch wants to impose a major rule, a rule that's going to cost $100 million or more, then Congress, this body, needs to approve the rule before it becomes a force of law. In 2010, according to the Congressional Research Service, executive agencies published over 100 major rules. These basically are rules that went into effect simply because the President said it's so. The Reins Act says no more, says no more. 
Now, once the executive issue, branch issues a rule, Congress now will need to approve it. Otherwise, it never takes effect. Stunning, that's something so, simplest, so simple that Congress should make the laws can be so contentious. I've heard my colleagues on the other side of the aisle say that if Congress just wrote better laws, more precise laws, the executive wouldn't need to regulate through these rules. The problem is that sometimes the executive branch agencies have shown they're using their regulatory powers to circumvent the legislative process. For example, after it was clear the Senate wasn't going to pass cap and trade, which really ought to be called cap and tax, the EPA just went ahead and started regulating greenhouse gases through the rulemaking process, cutting Congress out of the process altogether. This year's most expensive rule, the greenhouse gas cafe standards, is estimated to cost $141 billion. That's greater than the entire GDP growth for the United States in the first quarter of 2011. Well, you know, we're not all constitutional scholars. I'm certainly not. But if one thing is clear, Congress is the one who makes the laws. It's not Congress makes the laws unless they don't make the laws the president wants them to make. The regulations for executive need of Scrutiny Act brings us back to the basic foundation of our government. It says that Congress not only does it provide the legislative intent, but it also provides the legislative oversight as the rule comes back if it's a major rule that's going to cost over $100 million to our businesses and citizens of this country. It's what we're designed to do, to make tough decisions. That's why I'm so proud to co-sponsor this bill. That's why I'm proud to sponsor this rule and why I'm proud to vote for both the rule and the underlying legislation. With that, I encourage all of my colleagues to vote yes on this rule, yes on the underlying legislation, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Florida reserves the balance of his time. The general lady from New York is recognized. Good afternoon, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my friend for yielding me the customary 30 minutes and yield myself such time as I may consume. The general lady is recognized. Mr. Speaker, there's a very dangerous and cynical game being played in the House. Americans need jobs now, and instead of spending our time on job creation, the majority continues to waste time focusing on bills like this one that make it easier for polluters to spoil our air and water, make it easier for big banks to take the kind of risks that brought on our recession, and make it easier for unsafe products from China to poison our children. The majority seems to think that if they repeat their message that big government is destroying jobs enough times, it will become true. But economic surveys and economists from the left, right, and center say it's all a made-up argument. Bruce Bartlett, an economist who worked in the Reagan and first Bush administrations, writes that, quote, regulatory uncertainty is a canard invented by Republicans that allows them to use current economic problems to pursue an agenda supported by the business community year in and year out. In other words, it is a simple case of political opportunism, not a serious effort to deal with high unemployment, end quote. My friends on the other side of the aisle know this bill won't create jobs. And here's how we know. When the bill was considered for amendment, they will block an amendment that simply says, if the independent experts conclude a rule will create jobs that can go into effect without all these time-consuming extra steps. Now, why would we want to slow down a rule that could create tens of thousands of jobs? If this bill will create jobs, like the majority claims, what's the harm in saying the bill does not apply when it conflicts with the important goal of creating more jobs for Americans who are out of work? The majority cannot have it both ways, Mr. Speaker. It has now been a full 336 days since Republicans took control of the House, and they have yet to put a real jobs bill on the floor. But as of today, they've made time for 23 bills that would roll back protections for public health and safety. They provided ample floor time to defund public radio, to make it easier for felons to carry concealed weapons, and to reaffirm our national motto, which did not need reaffirming, and of course we did want to micromanage light bulbs. Why? Does the majority really think these are pressing national issues that demand our attention when we should focus on jobs? There's no doubt in my mind that in addition to making our workplaces, food, water, and airplanes less safe, 
H.R. 10 would endanger our fragile economic recovery, impeding job creation, and having the right amount of safeguards against bad behavior is part of what has made this country so economically successful. We all know that it was only after the financial sector was deregulated so much that we had the catastrophic housing crisis and the recession. Indeed, what regulation there was basically looked the other way. Indeed, in 2008, the Bush administration itself estimated that benefits to the economy for major rules outweighed the cost by at least two uh, to one, possibly as much as 12 to one, they said. And Mr. Speaker, I would be remiss if I did not explain the violence this bill does to the process of passing laws and may be unconstitutional. The process of executing the law is an important constitutional principle of separation of powers is in jeopardy here. The practical result of the bill's new additional steps to the regulatory process would be to grind the wheels of government to a halt. Our system of government already has the checks and balances built in to make sure that the regulations do what Congress says they should. That is why we have oversight committees. After Congress writes the laws, there are numerous statutes and executive orders that ensure an open process as an agency writes the regulations, requiring them to listen to the stakeholders and the public, to conduct cost-benefit analyses, justify every aspect of the, pro of the proposed rule. Congress also continuously keeps an eye on the executive branch by exercising its authorization, appropriation, and oversight functions. Furthermore, entities whose activities are regulated have access to the courts. When Congress last considered a nearly identical bill in the 1980s, the now Chief Justice John Roberts, who was then an associate White House counsel in the Reagan administration, criticized the legislation for, quote, hobbling agency rulemaking by requiring affirmative congressional assent to all major rules, end quote. He said that such a requirement would, quote, seem to impose excessive burdens on regulatory agencies, end quote. Justice Roberts was right then and he's right today. Congress writes the laws. We rely on professionals and experts, doctors, engineers, microbiologists, statisticians, and so forth to spell out the details of those policies so the law can be implemented and enforced in a way that makes sense. If this bill is enacted, those decisions will instead be made by members of Congress with no or little expertise in what they're talking about. In addition, with the staffs we now have, it would be an impossibility for us to be able to do it. Americans are sick of the Congress's political gamesmanship, and the last thing they want to do is extend its reach into vast new areas of our government. But the Rules Committee's primary responsibility in relation to H.R. 10 is to ensure the integrity of the legislative process in the House. In sending H.R. 10 to the House floor, the committee failed this responsibility. The sheer volume of additional measures the House and Senate would be required to consider should H.R. 10 become law is enough to force Congress to come back into the Capitol and work in shifts. Otherwise, we would never get it all done. Even though President Obama's administration has promulgated new rules at a slower rate than the Bush administration did in his last two years, that's right, you heard me, fewer regulations under Obama, the hundred or so new major bills on our schedule would mean we would have to take up to about seven of them a day on every other Thursday just to try to get it done. Inevitably, we could not finish it all, and under this ridiculous bill, that means we'd vote on the rest without debate. If the Rules Committee had bothered to hold any hearings on the bill, maybe the majority would have realized how drastically H.R. 10 undermines the deliberative process in this House. And finally, I want my colleagues to know that this rule deems packet, a passage of a non-germane amendment that was written by Mr. Ryan, the chairman of the Budget Committee. The Republicans made an embarrassing discovery at the Rules Committee last week. They realized that the hundreds of new measures the House would consider under this bill would uh, actually violate both their new cut-go rule and the pay-as-you-go statute that Democrats put in place. So the Republicans had a choice. They could either violate the budget rules 100 times every year or just pass an amendment to make these embarrassing violations vanish. Which one do you guess they chose? 
The rule includes a magic amendment that makes all budget violations go, violations go away in a big poof. But here's the best part. They're using the famous deem and pass procedure, which means the mystery amendment will be automatically adopted and the House will never vote on the Ryan Amendment. And I guess after we've all we've seen this year, it should not surprise me that last Tuesday the majority blocked our amendment to strip the special tax breaks from big oil companies supposedly because it was non-germane. That was Tuesday. On Thursday, they ignored the germaneness of the rule for this budget and this amendment. But most importantly, Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> we've had 336 days of Republican control of the House with no jobs agenda, and it is imperative that we extend the payroll tax cut and the unemployment benefits before Congress leaves Washington for the holidays. That is why I will amend this rule to require those votes if we defeat the previous question. And so I'm urging my colleagues on the other side, please stop worrying about your campaign message and start getting the message. America's top priority is job creation. Let's defeat this restrictive rule and get back to work on jobs, and I reserve the balance of my time. General lady from New York reserves the balance of her time. The gentleman from Florida. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I'd like to uh, yield three minutes uh, to the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry. I thank my colleague for yielding, and I am in favor of the underlying bill and the rule. When I talk to small business owners in my district in western North Carolina, I hear very clearly that regulations and regulatory uncertainty is, in fact, costing jobs. It's costing our economy, and it's making sure that unemployment remains high, which is an absurd policy coming out of Washington. Well, I know from my small business owners that regulations cost jobs. Even the Small Business Administration here in Washington, D.C., says that federal regulations cost $1.75 billion per year. That costs our economy. I'm sorry, let me restate that. It's $1.75 trillion a year. That is a major impact on our job creators. We know that regulations cost jobs. Now, some politicians in Washington that don't understand business think that their regulations create jobs. Well, they're right. They create federal jobs. They create more government employees. They create more people creating more paperwork for those that are trying to move our economy forward. We need to relieve our small businesses of this regula re regulatory hurdle and the challenges that they face. The Obama administration admitted one year ago at this time that they had over 4,000 regulations that they were trying to put in place actively. Over 200 of these regulations cost $100 million or more on the economy, seven of which will cost a billion dollars, a negative impact of a billion dollars. These regulations, even the Obama administration admits, cost the economy money. And if they cost the economy money, they're costing jobs. This is the wrong approach, this regulatory approach. What we need to say is if politicians in Washington think these regulations are in fact good, they need to proactively vote on them. When I go home and talk to small business owners, they wonder how these regulations actually go into place. It's faceless bureaucrats working behind desks in Washington that put them in place. And their elected officials here in Washington may be able to go home and say they're against them, but they've never had to cast a vote. What the RAINS Act does is say that the elected officials that come to Washington to represent their folks at home need to proactively put their stamp of approval or disapproval on these regulations. That way we can get this economy going again. That's what we need to be about. And I hope that we can have bipartisan support on this very important piece of legislation, the RAINS Act. I urge my colleagues to vote for it, and I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Speaker, I General yield two, from New York. I yield two and a half minutes to the gentleman from Massachusetts, member of the Rules Committee, Mr. McGovern. The gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized for two and a half minutes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this Republican leadership is starting to make me envious of the people of ancient Rome. Because although Nero only fiddled while Rome burned, at least he did something. House Republicans, on the other hand, have brought yet another piece of legislation to this floor 
that will do absolutely nothing, not a thing, to address the number one issue facing our country, jobs. Millions of Americans, through no fault of their own, cannot find work. That means millions of families are struggling to pay their bills, keep their homes, and put enough food on the table. And instead of facing this problem head on, the Republicans here in Washington are turning a blind eye to the needs of our neighbors. You would think that with all the recesses we take around here these days, my Republican friends would hear from their constituents about the still struggling economy. I know that's what I hear about from the people of Massachusetts. There are two things that we can and must do before we break for yet another holiday recess. Extend the payroll tax cut and extend unemployment insurance. By refusing to bring the payroll tax cut to the floor, the Republicans are risking tax relief for 160 million Americans while protecting massive tax cuts for 300,000 people making more than a million dollars per year. Extending and expanding payroll tax cut would put $1,500 into the pockets of the typical middle class family. Hundreds of thousands of jobs are at risk. Even Mitt Romney has come out in support of extending the payroll tax cut. If he could take a position, Mr. Speaker, I would hope that the House Republicans could do the same. And every dollar invested in unemployment insurance yields a return of $1.52 in economic growth. Again, hundreds of thousands of jobs are at risk unless we act. So instead of those simple, effective measures to improve our economy and, and spur job creation, we have before us yet another waste of time. It is time to put the people of this country first. I urge my colleagues to reject this rule, and I urge them to vote against the underlying bill. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Florida. Continue to reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman from Florida Reserves, General Lady from New York. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to yield three minutes to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Andrews. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for three minutes. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the members of the House should listen to the voices that have been raised about the jobs crisis in our country. These voices are speaking loud and clear. We should also listen to the quiet voices of desperation of so many Americans who will sit down this Friday night to try to pay their bills and find they have 70 cents worth of income for every dollar worth of bills that they have. Or the Americans who retired a few years ago and thought that they were set for the rest of their lives but are now looking at the one ads every day because they think they have to go get a job to continue to pay their bills and their retirement. Or the quiet, anxious voices of small business owners that are thinking that maybe this Friday will be the last Friday they keep their business open and they shut for good. These are the voices that should be heard in this country and they're not being heard by this majority. 89 days ago, the President of the United States came to this chamber and proposed four good ideas to put Americans back to work. Build more roads and bridges and schools to put construction workers back to work. We haven't taken a vote on that. Cut taxes of small business people that hire people in the private sector. We haven't had time to take a vote on that. Take teachers and police officers and firefighters who have been taken off the job because of this economic disaster at the state and local level and put them back in the classroom, put them back on the job. The majority hasn't had time to vote on that. And finally, let's avoid a tax increase of $1,000 a year or more on middle class families that's coming January 1st in 25 days, January 1st. But the majority hasn't had time to vote on that. We do have time today to vote on the temporary bankruptcy judgeship extension act of 2011. This is entirely appropriate. Bankruptcy judges are very busy in America today because when small businesses don't have customers and customers don't have money in their pocket and people don't have jobs to pay their bills, bankruptcy judges are very, very busy these ideas the president brought here 89 days ago. That's their prerogative and their right. But it's quite another to refuse to even put these ideas up for a vote. 
So I would say, Mr. Speaker, to all of our colleagues on both sides of the aisle, let's take this moment. Let's take this bill. Let's take this day to put on the floor of the House legislation that would postpone and cancel the tax increase on middle class Americans that's due in 25 days. Let's not have it. And let's extend jobless benefits for those who are diligently trying to find a job in this difficult economy. Let's find time to do something for the American people today. I yield back the balance. Gentlemen's time has expired.